Hey, thanks for stopping by YouTube. My name's Jim, and this is Exploretti. If you're returning to the channel, thanks a lot. Uh, it's actually pretty cool to make content that other people will spend their time uh, watching, even just a little bit. And if you're new to the channel, I like to uh, ride motorcycles. I like to ride adventure bikes. I'm just getting into that. I like to ride road bikes. Love checking out gear, love talking about gear. Uh, always kind of tinkering with stuff, trying to look for the next best thing, or at least prove to myself that what and how I've got something set up is, is working the best that it can for me. So if that's something that you enjoy, feel free to, to keep checking back for, for more content. Today, I'm gonna to be going through 10 things I love and 10 things I hate about my 2022 Harley Davidson Boomer Machine, Starbucks runner, Pan America special. Stay tuned. All right, so, Let's start off with number one, and that is adaptive ride height, or ARH. Adaptive ride height is one of the, now actually it's the biggest feature I looked at when I started looking at the Pan America. I had a smaller, lightweight adventure bike that I had been riding for uh, about a year, and the seat height on it was still pretty high, even considering it was a, an entry-level adventure bike. I hate to say entry-level, it was a, a lightweight adventure bike, still with a real tall seat height. And I just wasn't super comfortable with that. Coming from road riding, there's a certain amount of confidence that comes from, from the knowledge that you can put your feet down. And when you're riding in uneven and rough terrain, terrain that's gravelly and slippery, it's nice to know that. So adaptive ride height was really interesting to me. And if you're not familiar with adaptive ride height, basically what happens then with adaptive ride height is as you're coming to a stop, the motorcycle is looking at how much braking force you're using, how quickly you're decelerating. Um, and it it's determining the best time to lower the motorcycle between one and two inches so that when you stop, it's at its lowest point and boom, your feet are down. To get adaptive ride height, you do need to have a Pan America Special and then need to have the factory option for adaptive ride height. Adaptive ride height has a, a, about three, I'd say three different primary modes. First one is basically the one I described or the default setting where it's going to calculate when you're gonna be stopped and it'll be at its lowest point. The second mode that it operates in will allow you to specify a, a delay, either a short or a long delay, so that as you come to a stop, there'll be a little bit of a pause before it lets down. The last option is basically to turn off adaptive ride height. You're not giving up any suspension travel. Somewhere between 10 and 20 seconds after you accelerate again, the bike is back up to its normal operating height. I'm 5'10", and I don't have the longest inseam, and it really has helped quite a bit in gaining some confidence in tackling a new riding discipline, namely adventure riding. Uh, let's go on to B, and that is the Revolution Max engine. Harley-Davidson engineered the Revolution Max engine from a clean sheet, so it's not sharing any parts from an existing Harley-Davidson engine design, and it's not a partnership design, so Porsche is not involved. The design of this, man, it's 100% Milwaukee. It's manufactured, actually, up in Wisconsin. American-made, I think it's 1,250, 1,252 cc's to be exact, 150 horsepower, 94 foot-pounds of torque. It is a blast. It is a ton of fun. Harley nailed the engine. In addition to that, from a maintenance perspective, it's got a hydraulic valve adjustment, so you're not going to have uh, an expensive maintenance item for a valve adjustment at some point, which is great. All right, number three. Let's talk about ride modes. Ride modes aren't new, right? We've, we've had ride modes in a lot of more modern motorcycles, and ride modes are part of the, the Pan America. There are five different pre-programmed ride modes in the Pan America Special, and I believe there are three customizable ride modes. Ride modes are a way for the system to electronically control things like power delivery, engine braking, how much control ABS and traction control exert over the riding experience, and with the Pan America Special, also the semi-active suspension. You have the ability to change ride modes on the fly, and you'll 
feel that change during your ride with with one exception I'll get into in a, uh, a second. Those ride modes out of the out of the gate are, are road ride mode, which is um, I would consider that kind of touring or comfort mode. It does a pretty good job insulating you from the road. Throttle response is decent. Engine braking is fine. The suspension's pretty plush. Next you have sport mode, which is a lot of fun. Sport mode is going to tune up the throttle response. It really tightens up the suspension. In addition to sport, you've got rain mode. Of course, you would use it in traction compromise scenarios, rain. I also used rain mode when I picked up the bike. I figured, you know what, I'm going to ride this thing home in rain mode and then I'll start playing around with, uh, with it. Then you've got off-road mode, which again is adjusting those characteristics for more of an off-road environment. And then off-road mode plus. Now to get to off-road mode plus, you first have to be in off-road mode and then the bike does need to come to a full and, and complete stop. So in this instance, you do have to stop. Then you hold down the mode button until off-road mode plus is activated. To get out of that mode, just to the mode button again. Once you're in the off-road mode plus mode, it's changing things like throttle response, it's tuning down ABS and traction control, it's disengaging the linked braking system, it's allowing you to lock up the rear brake and loft the front wheel. It really, it, it can be a lot of fun. I'm still just getting into that, but it is it is a lot of fun. In addition to that, you've got a couple of additional uh, user customizable modes that allow you to control all the things that I've mentioned, uh, the throttle response, the engine braking, the suspension. There's a lot that you can get in there and adjust the adaptive ride height. So ride modes are a blast. They're a lot of fun. I know it's nothing new, but I think the implementation on the Pan America has, has been great. Uh, let's see, I think this is four. Let's talk about the dealer network. There's a lot of Harley Davidson dealerships around the world. In the US, I think there's upwards of um, 680 ish, 1400 uh, worldwide in 100 different countries. So there's a lot of, of dealers, independent dealers around the world, which is a pro. You know, if you're traveling, if you're touring, you're never that far away from a dealer. From an experience standpoint, I. I like being able to go somewhere else and swing in and see what the dealer has, what t-shirts, different parts. That's fun. I like that part of, of the ownership experience. Uh, if that's not your bag, I get it. I, one of the considerations when I was purchasing the Pan America, though, was that dealer network, knowing that there would be a lot of service and support opportunities as I as I traveled around, as I toured around. And one good example was on a tour, I was in California and decided to pick up a taller wind tar windscreen uh, and that worked out okay they, they had the part and it was, it was nice to be able to do that it didn't have to be ordered so the dealer network's a, a, a plus but it's also going to make another appearance all right uh e on the pan america special you have a semi-active show of suspension and it is really cool. It works really well. I think seven and a half inches of travel front and rear compared to some other adventure bikes is probably a little bit on the lower side. It's been fine for me uh, up until this point. So with the semi-active suspension, the bike is looking at things like the rider, is there a passenger, is there any luggage? And it's constantly evaluating that information and then setting preload. And it's taking other inputs such as the uh, speed of the bike, vertical acceleration, any braking information that's coming in. All of that data is getting crunched and constantly being used to adjust the preload on the bike. And it works really well. So the suspension has been really fun. I've gone over some pretty rocky terrain with it and the bike has felt incredibly planted. Number six sort of blends in really well with adaptive ride height, the, the saddle. The saddle has two positions right out of the gate. There's a low and high position. There's about an inch of adjustment between the two. If I'm riding off-road and it's somewhat questionable for me, I put the saddle in the lowest, uh, in the lowest setting. It just gives me that much more ability to touch the ground. You're not sacrificing, obviously, any ground clearance. You're just changing the, the distance between, let's say, the pegs and the saddle. If I'm gonna to be touring around or I'm gonna be mostly on the road, then I'll opt between low or high. I'll switch them back and forth and it does give your knee a little bit of a different position. Right out of the gate, right off the dealer floor, the ability to move the saddle between those two positions is a big deal. All right, what are we on G here, I think? I don't know. Let's talk about the next pro, the next thing I love, and that are the, the little creature comforts. The Pan America is the newest, most modern full kit bike that I've had. Creature comforts like TPMS are really nice. Heated grips 
Also, uh, really nice. In Colorado, uh, I definitely have had plenty of opportunities to use them. Any time in the year in the high country, you might run into some snow or at least cold weather conditions, so they're great. The, um, the icon looks a little bit like a hot dog. Uh, rolling on a rotisserie that you might find in a gas station if you've encountered that icon and asked yourself, what is this? Is there a, a rest stop coming up? No, it's heated grips. Cruise control is another huge win. And this is probably one that you would absolutely expect, especially in anything that's going to do some highway time, but it, I, I still like it. I still think it's a, 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 I still think it's a great uh, plus. The screen, and while it is a touch screen, I don't really, I don't know if I've ever used it as a touch screen. I do like the ability to customize the widgets on screen, can change the screen layout, light and dark modes. I also like that the screen widgets will reposition themselves based upon use case. If you accept an incoming call, first you can see that, uh, the gear indicator repositions itself, you can answer the call. I do like that functionality and I like tech toys anyway, so I would have loved to have seen Apple CarPlay and Android Auto incorporated into the bike at some point, but from what I understand, you can't incorporate those bits of tech without having two separate screens. And as we all know, the Pan America doesn't have that. Utility, uh, utility or versatility. I don't have a, a trailer. I don't have a way to transport a bike to a trailhead. I'm gonna get on the bike and I'm gonna ride it to the ride and I'm gonna do the ride and then I'm gonna ride home. Sure, are you sacrificing uh, extreme dirt performance? Yeah, just for me, that's not my use case. That's not the kind of riding I'm looking at doing. I do like the, the utility and the versatility of being able to leave the house, do the riding I like to do, forest service roads, you know, gravel, still looking for that manicured single track. I would still, I'd give that a shot. All right, let's move on to some of the things I'm not so stoked about on the Pan America special. Number one, early adopter and the growing pains that go along with it. Harley's introduced a phenomenal bike, but there's a lot of firsts in it. It's like uh, the Revolution Max engine, a lot of the electronics, the electrical wiring, just so much stuff packed in to this bike as a new experience. So there are a few things that clearly are problematic. One of those is software. The one nagging issue that I had encountered was a check engine light whenever I would get between 9,000 and 9,400 feet in elevation. It would pop on and assume that there was a uh, an intake air leak. I'm sure it had to do or does have to do with the uh, changes in barometric pressure, but it does make me question whether or not the bike was ever ridden uh, in a, a, a kind of an alpine or upper elevation environment. 9,000 feet's not that high. 9,400 feet's not that high. Uh, I don't know if it had been tested there. I don't know if it was simply the threshold at which um, that particular sensor would alarm, but kind of annoying. Uh, the first time it happened, I, I took the bike in for service. Can't find anything wrong with it. Second time it happened, it was within a mile of the location the first time it happened. So at that point, it was pretty easy to put together that it was either A, elevation and pressure, uh, or B, it was maybe some real strong RF interference. Electronics, a lot of electronics on the bike. So there's a lot that can go wrong. And uh, there are times where, where people have experienced some issues with, uh, with the Pan America. As early adopters of a product, if you're gonna have a premium product and charge a premium price, then we all want that premium premium experience. Flip side of that is human beings are involved in the creation of it, whether it's software, whether it's the design, the manufacturing. Yeah, there, there are things that are gonna go wrong. I think our expectation is good communication with the motor company and good support from a dealer network. I think those are key pieces uh, in that. I don't want to sound like a Harley apologist here, but it, it's clearly it's not just a Harley Davidson problem. My first adventure bike was a KTM 390 and it had certainly a few issues. And one of those was the motor would stall out when I would pull the clutch in at times. And a lot of other people experienced that that same hiccup. It's not a, a unique Harley Davidson problem. I don't think we, we all think that it is, but it, it's still frustrating. Number two, number three, C. Uh, the abysmal Bluetooth synergy. It is, it's frustrating at best. And the more Bluetooth connections you attempt to add, it just, it multiplies pretty quickly. So in my case, I've got a phone and I've got a comm unit on, um, on my helmet. I'm using the bike as sort of the hub. I'm pairing my phone to the bike and I'm pairing my comm unit to the bike. And that gives me the ability to use the hand controls so I can answer calls, I can 
turn the volume up and down, I can activate Siri, switch tracks. That works pretty well. If you turn to your left, there's a good chance you're gonna lose audio. The, the Bluetooth audio is not great at times. Versus if I were simply going to pair my comm system and my helmet with my phone, works great. But if you do that and then connect everything to the bike, it does not work very well. The problem really arises when I get on my second bike. Well, if I don't have my comm system and my my phone paired, then I've got to pair those two together just to get on that motorcycle. That can be a little uh, a little annoying. And then if you throw a GPS or something in there, uh, geez, good, good luck. I'm at the point where I'm kind of ready to give up on using the bike as the Bluetooth hub and simply use my phone. I think it's gonna end up working a little bit better. Now, is that something that could be solved via software? Uh, it's possible. We'll see how that progresses. All right, let's talk about aftermarket parts. And this is 0.4. So it's a new model, right? The Pan America, it's a, it's a new model. It's a new bike altogether. So I think it's reasonable to expect that the third party suppliers are gonna, they're gonna lag behind a little bit, especially with the pandemic. Yep, we've all, we've all heard that. We're all very well aware of it, but I was pretty surprised to see how low the supply of really high demand Harley Davidson accessories uh, were. Just trying to get a hold of luggage, which on a touring adventure bike is gonna be one of the most popular add-ons. I was I was surprised to see how long people were waiting, eight to nine months at times. And this is from the manufacturer. So they they had the fit and finish dimensions. They they knew how many bikes they were producing. I, I guess they just missed the target on, on the attach rate for luggage. It's just disappointing knowing that, hey, they're, they got plenty of parts to make bikes, but they don't necessarily have a great supply stream for repairs for service work, and then for accessories. So that's been a bit of a disappointment. We're starting to see that ease up a little bit, which is great. It's late 2022, it's late September, so it's nice to see that people are able to get some parts and accessories with a pretty short wait time now. All right, D, the dealer network. And I had this listed uh, as a love. I mean, I, something that I actually considered when I made my purchase, and that was the sheer number of Harley Davidson dealerships. The idea that I would be supported at home and while I was traveling. As a community, we're seeing that it's not playing out quite like that. As a new product, Harley Davidson certified technicians are a little bit more difficult to come by. So to work on a Pan America, you've gotta be a certified Harley Davidson tech. Now let's say a dealership has, let's say they have 10 techs. And out of 10 techs, if one of those is Harley Davidson Pan America certified, What's that going to do to service throughput for Pan Americas? It's not great. I think that Pan America owners are waiting an inordinate amount of time for service and support based upon part availability and then also service tech availability. And then the service techs that you get, they're, they're still learning. Right, they're learning literally one or two steps ahead of us, and it can be a little bit disappointing at, at times. It just feels like we are currently at the uh, the low part of the hockey stick, kind of waiting for a few more service techs to get certified, and then to have those service those service techs really take on the Pan America. In addition to that, they're probably not seeing a lot. There just aren't the Pan America numbers out there um, that you would have for a Sportster or a Road Glide or a Road King. So it's just taking time to build up some of that expertise and it can be uh, a little frustrating when we're looking for a, a, a premium experience to go along with that premium price and it's just not, it's not quite there yet. Number five, the windshield. It's not great, it's just not great. The stock windshield was flimsy. It is flimsy. The two inch or 18 inch high, it's two inches bigger, adventure windshield. It's more flimsy. It's They're both flimsy, optical clarity's not great. A lot of people are looking at third party solutions. I don't blame them. I'll probably be joining those ranks. Aside from the OEM look, which I do like, functionality is not great. It's adjustable. There are four positions that the windshield will uh, travel between and out of those four, I think everybody uses two. We all use the low one or position three. The second position's not, it's not great. The difference between the first and second positions, not, it's not big enough to warrant using it. So you, you go to the third one, which is kind of the highest position. And then the fourth position simply tips the windshield back more. 
So yeah, it's got four positions. Out of those four, we use two, and the windshield's a pretty flimsy material. So I don't love that. I wish it was a little bit, a little bit stiffer right out of the gate. All right, if you spend any amount of time on a Pan Am forum, whether it's on Facebook or one of the other Pan Am forums, you are going to come across several posts concerning the battery. There's a lot of questions regarding the batteries in Pan Ams. Are they big enough? Did they provide the cranking amps? Was there a bad batch? Are there gonna be any lithium ion batteries? I have had one scenario when the tips outside were a little bit colder, it's probably in the 40s. The bike had been out for a bit and it struggled to crank over. It did, it did eventually crank over. It was not super confidence inspiring. With that in mind, I've purchased one of those little jump packs that you can use to jump a motorcycle, which is great. I've never had to use it, but I do travel with it. That's not stopping me from using the Pan Am in any way. I'm not, I don't stay 50 miles around home, but the battery questions remain. This is probably a small one. I wish there would have been an OEM GPS or uh, accessory mounting bar included on the bike. Uh, there are other manufacturers that include them right out of the gate. E even another nice differentiator between the special and the normal Pan America. There are several aftermarket bars that you can get to mount accessories, whether it's a phone mount, whether it's a GPS mount. Tour Tech has one. I think Aluma Cycles uh, has another one. Maybe I'm nitpicking a little bit, but I, w I wished it would have been an OEM solution. I'm sure a lot of people have been waiting for this one, and that is engine temps and exhaust temps. There's no getting around the fact that the bike can run really hot. Throw in some warmer ambient air and it can roast you. My personal experience is, has really been on the right side, especially around my boot. Man, it gets hot. I've experienced it mostly in stop and go urban type traffic, dealing with hot pavement. If it's 85 degrees out, you're on a bike that it's running pretty hot anyway. Warmer than I would have expected, I guess. It can get downright, downright warm. A lot of people are looking for, whether it's exhaust wrap or other other shields to, to begin to mitigate some of that heat. And man, I'm kind of right along there with those guys i'm i'm just about to the point to where i need to start to do something with the exhaust the left side of the bike for me hasn't been really problematic at all i personally haven't run into the left side as being uh, much of an issue at all we've got a harley davidson it's an adventure bike kind of mean lean and the horn sounds like it's from a 1980 datsun it's not great that's something i absolutely will be changing. It is not very loud and it does not have a particularly authoritative note. It's more of a meep meep. So that's something I'd like to change um, with the bike. And I think Denali has uh, their sound bomb, which uh, I would love to, to look at once I get an idea on uh, what kind of wiring harnesses they have for the Pan America. On number nine, foot pegs. I do like the position of the foot pegs. The OEM foot pegs were pretty decent. They've got a removable rubber piece that'll give you a little bit better traction with adventure boots once that's gone. Just didn't care for the size. Foot pegs are, are going to work as a system with your boot. If you've got a, a boot that has a more pliable sole, then having a larger platform peg will be more beneficial. It just won't be as fatigue inducing. If you're riding in motocross boots that are really, really stiff, then the boot really kind of turns into your platform. And having a bigger, a bigger peg with a larger purchase area is maybe a little less important. I definitely found that I wanted a larger, a larger peg. So I, I did swap out my pegs for something a, a bit bigger and no looking back. I, I still think that my feet, are the, they are the first thing to fatigue. But again, I, I may end up looking at my boots, how the boots interact with the pegs, and then determine where where and what change I need to make. But overall, uh, the, the peg location's great. I just didn't love the peg size. Thought they were a little bit small. Lastly, handlebar vibration. Motorcycles are they're gonna vibrate, right? Whether it's the handlebars, the pegs, or the seat, those three contact points. I found that the handlebars were a little too vibey for me. So it didn't take too long, and that was probably one of the first mods I did with the bike, uh, is to add some weighted bar ends. And they were they work well. It was like a night and day difference. They work well enough to where I just kind of forget that they're there. The ones I 
bought completely integrate with the existing wind guards or, or hand guards so they look kind of like that OEM plus I love that but without them the bars were a little bit vibey well that wraps up my list of the things I love about the Harley Davidson Pan America special and the things that I don't love uh, about it and I think everybody's list is going to be a little bit different there's a chance that I forgot something super obvious and if I did please Throw it down in the comments below. I'd love to see what other experiences um, riders are having. There's not a lot of Pan Americas near me. I think I've seen one other Pan America out in the wild. Uh, so I'd love, to, uh, I'd love to hear what other people are running into. Thanks a ton for tuning in. If you've made it this far, I appreciate it. It's great. Uh, if you've found some value in the content, that's even, even better. So, um, until the next video, make sure your run to Starbucks is great. If you have any other ideas for videos, throw them in the comments. Uh, and if you have some things you've experienced, throw them down in the comments and see what other people have to say about it. Uh, I like it quite a bit. Man, it's hot in here. Hey, I'll make a, a little studio in the garage. That, yeah. Good idea, right? Yeah, who knows why? It got real hot. All right.